morning, church. I am not Paul Wilkerson, and I am not your senior pastor. I'm Blake Shoecraft, and I serve as the missions and discipleship pastor here at First Baptist Church. Typically, you see me giving announcements every Sunday morning, and I'm affectionately known by the staff as the pastor of announcements. So buckle up. We're going to have about 30 minutes of those, okay? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, we are glad you were here this morning. If you're a guest, welcome. I'm glad I'm here this morning as we get to open up God's Word together. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. We will be in verses 14 through 26 this morning. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Now, Paul is getting a much-needed rest and vacation during this fall break. I know many of you are traveling. We have many folks out. But leave it to Paul. We've known each other for a while. Leave it to Paul to give me one of the most difficult texts in the book of James, and arguably one of the most controversial texts in the book of James, and maybe even in the entire New Testament. Leave it to Paul to give me that text this morning. So one of my goals for us this morning is to see how this text, when properly understood, is not that controversial. It's really not. Uh, What's the controversy here, you might ask? Well, hang with me. We will talk about that. Our second goal for us this morning is to see that the text we are faced with today is a very serious text. It has huge implications for our lives today, how we live the rest of our life, and ultimately for eternity. This is a very serious warning text we are faced with. But before we read James 2, I want to set our attention on the words of the Lord Jesus when he preached his sermon on the mount. And he told one of the most horrifying realities and one of the most terrible truths that will occur to many people when they stand before him one day. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. This is the words of the Lord Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Here in this text, Jesus tells us that the kingdom community, his church, must guard herself against false disciples, false followers of him. On that day, that day, the day that is supposed to be glorious, the day that you are standing before, the day that you have worked your whole life, that you have spent your life standing before him on that day, and you say, Lord, Lord, and he looks at you and says, I never knew you. Church, an audible confession of Jesus as Lord does not always indicate a repentant heart. It's a terrifying truth. I don't know about you, but I don't like surprises. I don't like surprises. I don't. I like to to anticipate things well. I like to have relative assurance in a, in a plan. I like to know what's coming. And Jesus says, on that day, there will be many surprises. There are people thinking that this is the day. We just sang about that. This is the day. Oh, what a day that will be. Only to find out that Jesus will look at them and say, I don't know you. This surprise on that day will not happen to a few, church, but it will happen to many. There can be no doubt about it. On the day of judgment, it is going to be a day of many surprises. I don't like surprises. I've been burdened by this text this week in James. I'm reminded of this, of just as we steward the gospel, as we steward the just beauty of what salvation is and what it means to follow Christ, there's a spiritual responsibility that we have as pastors in the church for, for the congregation and the body to recognize that this has eternal ramifications. This matters. This is not a game. So as we come to this text, and I have just 
poured out in this text this week, the question that I want us to wrestle with this morning, the essential question of this, this sermon, is how do I know that I am right with God? How do I know that I am right with God? That's where we find ourselves this morning, faced with that question in the book of James. It's a question, friends, that we must get right. We dare not look at this question and think, it doesn't matter. I will set it to the side. We must answer this honestly. In the book of James, James chapter 2, I think he reveals to us this question, the answer to this question very clearly. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart, of, apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you, we, we love you and we praise you for your word. And I pray uh, that today we would just honestly assess ourselves as we come to this text, that we can answer the question, how do we know we are right with you? God, it is a horrifying reality that on the day of judgment, you will look at people and say, I never knew you. God, I pray. God, I earnestly pray that people in this place would not face that reality, but they would hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. God, we earnestly pray for that. God, that people wouldn't be spiritually blind, but they would know that they are right before you, not because of what they do, but because of who you are. God, and as we come to this text, I pray that we could see the evidence in our lives that you are good and that we are right with you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as you can tell, church, I am burdened by this text. As I was studying through, through it this week, it occurred to me that sometimes we rely on the wrong things. We go through life relying on the wrong things. We're led to think that if we get these things right, then we're okay. We're good. Everything will work out. Everything's fine. But James points out that we are in danger and can be in danger of relying on the unreliable and deceiving ourselves. We're at risk of thinking that we're okay when we're really not. And what James does is he distinguishes what true faith is and what a bogus faith is. is. What real faith looks like and what it doesn't. And that we can come before the text and just say, how do I know I am right with God? And we can answer that question. And the first thing I want you to see is that true faith is more than our words. True faith is more than our words. Look at what James says in verses 14 to 16. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and any one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So if you remember where we were last week, James just told his audience 
that they must not show any partiality to anyone. He, you don't show a difference between the poor and the rich. And clearly, there are both groups within their midst in this group. As we discussed last week, James chapter 2, 1 through 13, it's not hard to imagine that we have individuals who are gathered together in worship who are from all kinds of different socioeconomic statuses. There are rich in the church. There are poor in the church. The gospel is not just for the poor. The gospel is not just for the rich. The gospel is for everyone. The church is made up of a community of different believers from various backgrounds. Same is true for us today. There is no difference here. But we need to point out what James is referring to in verse 15. He's not talking about someone who is a little strapped for cash, okay? He's not talking about somebody who is, you know, having trouble paying their car insurance that much, that month, or uh, maybe they can't go out to Cracker Barrel and eat as often as they would like. What he's talking about is someone who is lacking the daily necessities to live. He says someone who is poorly clothed and lacking daily food. They can't eat. They don't have the proper clothing. They're deficient in the basic necessities of life. And James gives them this illustration, and he says, if you have this situation that comes to you, and you respond in this pious prayer, and you say, go in peace, be warmed and filled, well, it's not really pious at all. He says it's a cop-out. It's the mask of spiritual sincerity. Like, it's a prayer, but it has no profit or honor. He's saying you didn't do anything. It's just an illusion. You're fooling yourself. When this scenario plays out, as James uh, says that it does, he says you can say the right thing, but not do the right thing. You can say it. That sounds great. Go. Go in peace. Be warmed and filled. But you did not do a thing to alleviate that situation. Like what's happening here is they are essentially pronouncing a blessing on a poor Christian brother or sister. And it's not that their words are wrong. It's that the words are covering for their inaction. They're neglecting a brother or sister. And what James is telling us is that if our faith is all about saying the right thing, okay, But it's not. He's saying it's not about that. Just saying the right thing is not good enough. We can say the right thing, but if there's not evidence of what we say and how it changes the way we act, we're deceiving ourselves. You can say the right thing all day long, but if it does not change how you act upon a situation, you are fooling yourself. That is what he's telling us. We come to the church every week. We say the right things to each other. It's not enough. James says in verse 14, what good is it? He's bringing attention. He's saying, what good is it? And then he says the same thing again in verse 16. What good is that? Then James does what he does best if you have been with us through our study in the book of James. He smacks the reader in the face with his main point of this section. He just hits you right in the gut with it. And he says it in verse 17. He says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Did you hear that? It's dead. It's useless. It's lifeless. It produces nothing. He's saying, what good is it? It's not. It's dead. True faith is more than our words. True faith is more than what we Say. And he goes on in verse 18 and he says, But someone will say. Notice here that James is bringing up a hypothetical response. He just said his main point. Now he's bringing up an objector, somebody who's going to counter his argument, someone critical of his main point. And he's getting ahead of this person and he continues arguing that the main point of his text is faith without works is dead. It's not a real faith. So he's in this hypothetical conversation, and this objector says this, You have faith, and I have works. 
Well, this person is arguing that faith and works are separable. They don't have to be connected. And James responds to this person. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James tells us that we can say the right things. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and not have true faith? Depart from me, I never knew you. We can say it, but it does not mean it. According to James, believing the right things isn't enough either. In verse 19, he tells us that even demons believe. Like that should just shock us when we're reading that. Even demons believe. The people, the the creatures that are in complete and total opposition to who God is, and they believe. True faith is more than our words. And second, true faith is more than what we believe. In the Gospels, we see many encounters that Jesus has with demons, one of which is in Luke chapter 8, verses 27 and 28. This is what it says. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from a city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. We have another example in Mark 1 where Jesus is in the synagogue and there's a man possessed by a demon and the demon says this to Jesus, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Did you catch that? Like the demons believe and say Jesus is Son of the Most High God or the Holy One of God. But that is shocking. Like we're Southern Baptists, right? If you didn't know this, this is a Southern Baptist church, and we have a statement of faith. We affirm the Baptist faith and message 2000. I pulled some quotes from the Baptist faith and message 2000 that the demons would agree with as a part of our doctrinal statement. Here's what it says. Baptist faith and message 2000, section 2 on God. There is only one living, true God. He is intelligent, spiritual, and a personal being, the creator, redeemer, preserver, and ruler of the universe. The demons would believe that. Baptist Faith and Message, Section 2, Article B, talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ is the eternal Son of God. They've affirmed that. In his incarnation as Jesus Christ, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus perfectly revealed and did the will of God, taking upon himself human nature with its demands and necessities and identifying himself completely with mankind, yet without sin. We're 100% so far. He honored the divine law by his personal obedience and is in his substitutionary death on the cross. He was raised from the dead, was glorified body and appeared to his disciples as the person who was with them before his crucifixion. He ascended into heaven and now is exalted at the right hand of God. He will return in power and glory to judge the world and to consummate his redemptive mission. The demons would affirm those statements. They agree with that. Like that is crazy. The demons are monotheists. The demons are Trinitarian. The demons believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That he died on the cross and rose from the grave. They're aware of that, that he is king of kings and lord of lords, that he sovereignly reigns over all things. He has authority over them and over all creation. R. Kent Hughes said this, some demons have better theology than we do. And yet, they shudder. That word shudder means a violent convulsion. 
uncontrollable shaking. They tremble as a result of fear. And what are they afraid of? They know that belief in God is not enough. They will be judged for eternity due to their rebellion, and they have no hope. You can believe in God. You can even have the right theology about God. It's important. But James says it's not enough. It's not enough to save you. It's not true faith. True faith is more than what we say. True faith is more than our words. And true faith is more than what we believe. There are many individuals, as I was just studying, that are so-called experts in their field. Okay, there's, there's experts all over the world. They've written extensively in areas. But what I notice is there are these so-called experts who have never personally practiced what they are an expert in. I found a few examples. There's a business consultant who has a podcast or a website and a website. He's authored books on how to build your business and make it successful. This person offers advice on management practices and financial strategies to make your business the best it possibly can be. The problem is he's never owned a business himself. He's never ran his own business. What about a parenting expert I found who writes on child development? They write on discipline methods, and based on her research, she shows how parents should properly raise their children. What's the problem? She doesn't have any kids. How is she an expert, or how reliable is that expert? But here's the best one I found. Bill Hillman is an author, speaker, and professor at East West University in Chicago, where he teaches writing, literature, journalism, and speech. As a college student, Bill was uh, given a book by a professor who exposed him to the work of great literature, specifically the literature of Ernest Hemingway. He gave him the book, The Sun Also Rises. In that book, it details the festival of Pamplona in Spain and the running of the bulls. Anybody familiar with the running of the bulls? I've got a few pictures. I'm going to show those first two pictures here of the festival of Pamplona. Doesn't that look exciting? Like you see the fear on these people's face. That guy is back on the ground covering in the fetal position. A guy got knocked over down there. These are massive bulls who are running and you're trying to avoid not getting trampled basically is what's happening. Go ahead and show the next picture. Oh, yeah. See, this guy is pushing these dudes out of the way. He's kind of holding them and trying. I don't know what he's doing. We're going to assume good intentions there, but we just don't know. So Bill was fascinated. Hillman was fascinated with the runnings of the bulls, running of the bulls. So what happened is he read this book and he was hooked. He wanted to know everything about the running of the bulls. And he devoted his career to become an expert on this specific subject. And eventually, after becoming a recognized expert in the field, he co-authored a book called Fiesta, How to Survive the Bulls of Pamplona. However, the problem was he had never actually ran with the bulls. So he's an expert in his field. He wrote a book on how to survive this, but he's never actually done it. Go ahead and show the third picture there. That's Bill. That is Bill. This all changed in 2014. Just knowing about bull running was not enough. Saying the right things, believing and even knowing enough to write a book on how to survive, an instruction manual on bull running was not enough for Hillman. So in his first encounter with the bulls of Pamplona, a 1,320-pound fighting bull named Bravito lagged behind the pack and gored Hillman in his right thigh, sending him to the emergency room. Now, he made a full uh, recovery and has ran with the bulls about 300 times now. This is taken much later. You can see he's gotten a lot better. But after this event, he appeared in a New York Times article 
And they asked him about surviving the bulls of Pamplona. And, he, and he, him and his co-author said this. They said, we will probably need to update the book. It's one thing to say you know how to survive and even believe you know how to survive running with the bulls. You're an expert. You wrote the book on it, after all. But then there is putting it into practice. James nails down the point. You can take that picture down. James really nails down the point that there is a connection between what you say, what you believe, and what you practice. There is a connection here. Do you say the right things? Do you believe the right things? That's a good start. But it's not enough. James says you may, in fact, be in danger of fooling yourself into thinking you're okay and thinking that on that day you were good, but then you were in for a horrific surprise. I don't like surprises. Neither what we say nor what we believe is evidence of true faith, according to James. How can you tell if you're right with God? You can't tell simply by what you believe or by your words. So how can you tell? We will continue reading. James is still in this hypothetical conversation with his objector. And to this point, he has said, faith without works is dead. And he just used this negative example of a demon who believes in verse 19. And as if that were not enough, he's going to call this objector a fool and give two positive examples here. Verse ch- chapter 2, verse 20 through 26. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was also not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So James just looks at his readers or looks at his audience and he says, I will show you that faith and works are connected. And then he gives two very opposite examples of characters in scripture who demonstrate faith through their actions. Now here's where we're starting to enter that controversy that I was telling you about. However, for the attentive reader, this is not controversial. We know that in Genesis, Abraham was saved by faith through belief in the Lord. Genesis 15, 6 says, And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's what we know about Abraham. Fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul uses this passage twice in the book of Romans to prove that an individual cannot be saved by their works or what they do, but by faith alone. However... James says that this genuine faith, a true, authentic, real faith, works itself out in a person's actions. In Abraham's case, his faith and trust in God led him to offer Isaac on the altar, his son. We know the rest of that story, that God provides a substitute for Isaac, and God blesses Abraham. Genuine faith brings about good works, James is telling us. You are saved by faith, but if your faith does not change your life, it is not a true faith. It's a faith that hears the word, but does not do it. It's a faith that the demons possess. It's a dead faith. Abraham is his first example. And then James goes on the complete opposite extreme and mentions Rahab, a Gentile prostitute 
if Abraham is this towering figure in the Bible, the main cast, Rahab is this background participant. Abraham was the father of Israel. Rahab was a foreigner. Abraham is honored, and Rahab is scandalous. It shouldn't be a surprise to us that James uses such opposite examples, right? He's been doing this already. He isn't showing partiality. James is making a point. It does not matter who you are. Genuine faith works in the same way. When Rahab protected the spies of Israel, the people of God, against her own people, James says that she shows true faith. She works out her faith in her actions. You can say that you have all the faith in the world. You can have the appearance of faith. You can serve in the church for decades. You can believe the right things, but until that faith works itself out in genuine action, you can't say that you have true faith. Regardless where you are on society spectrums, the father of a nation or a prostitute, rich or poor, you cannot have true faith without acting upon it. That's what James is telling us. There's no such thing as an inactive faith. It's very countercultural to the church today in the West, I would argue, is we have this Instagram sort of faith. You know what an Instagram faith is? It's I scroll and I like what I like and I scroll right past what I don't like. In other words, a buffet-style faith. Everybody likes a buffet. Why? Because you get to consume as much as you want, skip over what you don't like, and just take what you like. That's the faith James is describing. It's a self-centered faith, not a Christ-centered faith. It's a faith that is all about you as a consumer. It's a faith that is inactive. And James says in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. This is the controversial verse that we were talking about. We touched briefly on what that controversy looks like, but now it's here. So I want us to specifically look at this verse. This verse seems to directly contradict the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, which says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And this verse is in large part why Martin Luther called this book an epistle of straw. If you remember a few weeks ago when we opened this up and Paul talked about Luther. He was battling against the Catholic Church that said a person can be right with God based on their works, based on their actions, based on what they do and not by faith alone. And Luther said at one point, I almost feel like throwing Jimmy, the book of James, into the stove. So I have a nice chart to show you on the screen. I think it's in your handout here. How do we reconcile these verses? Who is right here? We see Romans 3.28 and James 2.24. A person, a person is justified, is justified by works and by faith. Well, there's a big difference. Not by faith alone, apart from works of the law. How do we reconcile these two seemingly opposite things? We know that the Bible is true and without error. It's inerrant. It's inspired by God, divinely inspired. Like we, we can trust and have confidence in the word of God because he is who he says he is and God is a God of truth and not lies. So how do we reconcile these two verses? Who is right? Well, first, as we just pick these verses apart, Paul and James are using the term justified in two different ways here. I believe Paul Wilkerson mentioned this a few weeks ago on Hearer and Doer of the Word. I know you remember everything about it. Justification, sanctification, he had that chart. So what's going on here? So the Apostle Paul asserts that a person is justified, and when he is using this term, here's what he's saying. Justification, an act of God whereby he pronounces a sinner righteous because of a sinner's faith in Christ. One theologian put it like this, properly understood, justification has to do with the declaration about the sinner and not the change within the sinner. That is what he is talking about here. That is how Paul's using the word. 
how you are standing before God, declared righteous through the work of Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection. James is using the word justified to emphasize the way in which works demonstrate how a person has been justified. The evidence of good works in their life change within the sinner. The sanctification. He's using that term to show you how do you know you're justified? How you live your life. Show me how you live your life and I'll tell you about your faith. That is what James is doing here. So we see justified as being used differently. Now we see Paul and James are talking about two different kinds of faith. Paul says a person is justified by faith apart from works. James is telling us you were justified by works apart from faith. Well, that's a big difference there. How are we justified? Paul says this. James says this, excuse me. James says faith alone. So when he is using that term faith alone, he is, means this bogus faith. The faith that he is talking about in this section, this dead faith, this intellectual agreement apart from a genuine personal trust in Jesus Christ, this kind of faith that his objector is advocating for. It makes sense because this is what he has talked about the entire time. What if you say you have faith but don't have works? Can that save you? The objector says, you have faith, I have works. He's talking about this inauthentic, this fake faith. The kind of faith that the demons believe. The kind of faith that is apart from works is not an authentic faith. This is what James is talking about in this verse. Paul is talking about an authentic, true, genuine faith in Christ. Who is right here between James and Paul? The answer is they're both right. Both are absolutely correct. There's no contradiction here between the two. If we read it just surface level, we're like, oh, no. But as we start to look at the context of both writers, we can see that this is not a contradiction. Paul shows how God forgives sinners. That's what the Apostle Paul is doing in Romans 3. James shows how genuine faith operates. That is what our text is doing. Paul says we're saved by faith in Jesus. James says that a sign of genuine faith is that the result, it results in real, measurable changes in our lives. If we can't see how it's changed us, then there's a good chance that we never had that genuine faith to begin with. David Platt said this, and I wanted to share it with you. He said, James has already shown us that in chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, verses 21, and again in chapter 2, verse 5, he has made clear that faith is something God gives, not something we manufacture. This cannot be emphasized enough. We are saved by the abundant grace and glorious initiative of God. Acts of mercy are are not means to salvation. We don't help the poor in order to be saved. Rather than being the means to salvation, acts of mercy are necessary evidence of salvation. We might also call acts of mercy the natural overflow of salvation. A faith that doesn't reveal in its work itself in works in a changed lifestyle, friends that glorifies God and has compassion on others and hears the word but doesn't do it, that is a dead and worthless faith. Martin Luther, the man who called this book an epistle of straw and wanted to throw Jimmy in the stove, said this, We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. We don't have a saving faith if there's no evidence of change in our lives. It's dead. You can go ahead and take that chart down. As I come to a close this morning, 
how can you tell if you're right with God? You can tell not simply by what you say or what you believe, but how it has changed your life. On that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. This text has such implications, church, for us today and for eternity because there are people, there are people who once made a commitment to Christ, who audibly confessed, Lord, Lord, but it has not changed their life. You're banking on a decision you made on a specific date. Your name is on the membership roll. You signed the dotted line. You walked the aisle. You prayed the prayer. But in reality, it has not changed your life. On that day, there will be many surprises. Depart from me. I never knew you. Lord, Lord, I don't know you. Friend, if you are here today, whether this is your first time here, whether you have been here for 50 years, if you've made a decision and you are no different today than you were on the day you made that decision, don't be surprised. Don't. There's a difference between us and the demons. Is we have hope. You have time. There is still an opportunity. James says that if that is you, you are fooling yourself. Your faith is dead. If there is no change in your life and you just come in week in, week out, check the box for the week, I'm good to go. And there is no evidence of change. You are dead in your faith. If your faith is dead, and if your faith is dead, you are still dead in your sins. Destined for eternal hell apart from God. How do you know you are right with God? If you really put your faith in Jesus, it is going to change you. The Spirit is going to move in your life, and He will make changes. You won't be perfect, but you will be different. It will change the way you see people. It will change your heart before God. It will cause you to struggle with sins that you used to love. You will not be perfect. You will never be perfect in this life, but your faith will change. It will change you. That is a true faith. That is genuine faith. That is what is available to anyone who wants to receive it. Do not settle. Do not settle for a faith that says, I can just come in, live my life, and I'm going to be okay. That is not true faith. A faith that has not changed your life is dead. That is what James is telling us. That is what has burdened me this week. That is my fear. No one wants to stand before the throne one day and before the Lord Jesus and say, like, this is it. I never knew you. Don't do it. Don't settle Receive the real Jesus, like receive his grace in your life, and you will not be the same. He will change you, not by your works, but through his death and his burial and his resurrection. What Paul tells us in Romans 3, you will be saved, and it will change your life, and you will work as the evidence of your faith. You won't be the same because you can't be the same. It's impossible. Come to Jesus Christ and receive the true, authentic, real faith that he offers. There is grace found at the cross of Jesus. Come to him. Will you pray with me? God, as we come before you, Lord, now this is a difficult text, but it is a needed text. God, you have given us in your word a warning and a truth that says we can know if we, are, if we are right with you by the evidence in our life. A tree is known by its fruit. It's evident by how we live. So God, I pray if there is someone here today, whether they have been coming once and this is their first time or they have been here for decades, God, if they are here today and they say, there is no change in my life, I am no different 
the day I started and made a profession of faith or what sounded like that to today, God, I pray they would be convicted and come to you and trust in you, not through anything I've said, but from what you have done, from what your word says. God, it is, it is so apparent that we need you. We cannot do this on our own. God, my fear is that we are in danger of thinking, some of us are thinking that we're okay and we're not. God, I pray that that would not happen in our church. I pray that there would be no surprises on that day, but we would stand before you and we would hear, well done. You ran the race well. You fought the good fight of the faith. You have come to me and you have worked and you have shown yourself to me. I know you. You are mine. And we can enter into eternity with you what a glorious day that will be. God, I pray that that would be the case. God, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.